Welcome to another exciting edition of Tiffin Box TV. I'm your host, Sei Shu. I'm really honored to introduce and welcome Mike Michalowicz. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, uh, author, speaker. His books include The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, The Pumpkin Plan, and Profit First. His writing has also been published on the Wall Street Journal, and he appears on MSNBC's Your Business segment, dispensing advice in his usually concise yet witty manner. Now, if you've ever seen him on uh, like his videos, his short clips, oh my God, they're so funny, they're amazing, they're to the point, but they're also, they take you to the next level in terms of understanding your business. Uh, I've, got, I've gotten a lot out of uh, Mike's uh, videos, actually, and I'm reading The Pumpkin Plan at the moment. Now, Mike is, a, is the CEO and founder of a, of a company called Provandus Group, uh, a firm that helps industry experts quickly scale their business. Now, why is this all relevant to photographers, you know? Well, the fact is Mike's coming down to, well, coming up, I guess, from New Jersey. It's me, it's yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He's coming up to Connecticut, and he's going to be hosted by the Connecticut's ASMP chapter on February 5th, and he's going to be speaking at Yale University about the pumpkin plant. And so I wanted to welcome him, invite him to come in and just give us a little brief look at, you know, what he's going to be talking about. And it's exciting because, hey, I'm his, I'm one of his biggest fans, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you are. I there knew you I were am. out there, Sishu. Yeah. Sure. There you are. <laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, thanks so much for joining me, Mike. I appreciate uh, it. Oh, man, this is great that we're connected. So thank you. You know, your books are, are hugely popular. They've been translated into like a number of languages. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, you've, <laughs> you, your books are, you, your books have, have sort of given uh, a certain uh, cachet, a brand for you in terms mm -hmm. of to go out and speak with not just, uh, you know, business people, but uh, people who are, uh, you know, creative as well, you know, like oh, photo sure. photographers, right? Uh, sure. So it's so applicable as to your, your the message you bring is so applicable to photographers uh, and creative art, like artists. You know, let's call them just artists, right? Absolutely. What What is it that that you feel uh, c clicks to for people? Like when they read your book, why is it it's it's so uh, obviously <coughs> easy for them to to take on the the message you're trying to give them? I think. You know, the reason I wrote the books is I, I love to read books. You can't see it off camera, but I got stacks of books piled up here, there, like all over my office, and I got more at my other office. I got so many books. But what I realized is that most reads are very academic, mm -hmm. um, and many reads are theoretical. Like, you know, like I love Malcolm Gladwell's books, for example. Very academically written, sure. amazing case studies, theory about how to get, you know, what the tipping point's all about, but doesn't give you practical stuff. So I was like, I wish there was more books out there that, were arm over the shoulder, you know, a guy grabbing a beer with you who's been through the experience, right. telling you what, you know, how tough it can be, and and sympathizing with you, but then giving you very small steps to take that are very actionable, very easy. So that's when I started writing because I just wanted books like that for myself, and um, it, it it connected, it connected. The, Absolutely, I've been blessed. There's a there's a very sizable community that likes that. I think it's. I don't think it competes with the Malcolm Gladwell books of the no. world or Seth Godin's, but I think it complements it. I think we have to understand the theory and then see practical applications of it. The examples you give, by the way, are phenomenal. I mean, they're 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 like you know your uncle, or your your <laughs> aunt, or whatever. I mean, they're all like you know people that you can totally relate to, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And because all, all businesses start that way. You know, we read about. At least I do the stories of Mark Zuckerberg, a billion dollar corporation. He's got all these people working for him. Hewlett Packard. You name the business. Steve Jobs. All these things, when I read about them, it's now that they have the 100 employees or the 1,000 employees, right. now that they're established. But very few stories are about their early stages where they're working out of the garage. Yet that's where most of us are. So all those businesses started as an idea, started out of um, a garage or a dorm room or in a basement. And at a certain point, those businesses decide to scale up. Every business starts there, um, almost all businesses. And my passion is in that early stages. We aren't required to grow these massive businesses with all these employees, but I think what is mandated is that we love what we do, that we're contributing um, to the world in whatever way we define it, but also that we're making money to continue and sustain. Mm -hmm. So the, the community I love is the early stage bootstrappers out of a basement. It, it just resonates with me, and that's the community I like to talk with. Absolutely. Um, 
the books you've also written uh, are, are as, as we've already discussed, geared towards really anybody who is interested in creating a business for themselves and scaling it up, right? Yeah. So let's talk about photographers. Right? Mm -hmm. Photographers, typically, a, a, either a portrait photographer or a wedding photographer, sure. is usually a one-person operation. Usually, right? yeah. Right? So how do you how do you tell a photographer, okay, it's it's this is how you should scale up. I mean, what is what is what is one way that they can scale up without losing their mind? Yeah, yeah, and, and losing the creativity. So yeah, you know, exactly. first thing, the first thing I get Shishu, from the, these folks, uh, photographers, painters, sculptors, is my business isn't scalable, Mike. It's me. It's my creativity. So you're an idiot already, Mike. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I challenge. I didn't call you that. <laughs> no, you didn't. You did. <laughs> Okay. Uh, in, your, in your head, maybe a lot of people say it's it's a non-scalable business because it's an artist, and I call bullshit on that. Really? Um, okay. Actually, I'm writing a new book now about streamlining the creative market. Awesome. And I read a story in the 1800s, or maybe it was the 1600s. There's a guy you can look him up. The name was Peter Lely, L-E-L-Y. Peter Lely was an artist in England doing portrait arts, and he came up with. Uh, he's famous for this thing called the Windsor Beauties. It was all the uh, royalty of the time that he was painting. Oh. But he was the most prolific painter, producing a volume of about 10 to 15 times any other painter, yet his the quality was amazing and he became world famous. He, he was knighted and all this stuff and he amassed a fortune. So my question is, how could this one painter like paint so much? Was he constantly awake? No. He systemized creativity. What he did was he would go to his subject and he would paint the face, which is the most critical component of, of the painting work. Then the remaining part, the body, which took 80% of the time to paint, he had actually pre-painted 10 figures. And he told his apprentices then, just copy these figures. So literally, oh, he'd wow. yell over to his, his apprentice, apprentice and say, throw on number three on this face. And then they would start <laughs> painting the rest of it. So the apprentice spent 80% of the time or more right. doing the painting. He just did the only part that really mattered for creativity. And therefore, 80% of his workload was transitioned out. And this guy amassed a fortune but doing this and became world famous. Sure. So <clears throat> we as creatives have to realize uh, we're applying that creative umbrella to all our work. We, we feel that's necessary for us to do everything to be a creative. And that's where I call bullshit. To be a creative, what's the one very narrow specific thing that is mandated that you do it, but the other 80, 90% that can be systemized or handed off, we have the responsibility right. to hand that off so we can continue to do our creative specialty. Wow, that's that's as as I told you guys, uh, and I'm talking to my audience now. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you get from Mike. I mean, really concise and two swears. <laughs> Swear, well, you haven't started swearing, swearing yet. <laughs> I start standing up. I like start punching the screen. I know. Um, I know. Y'all are in for it when we okay, meet up. Th this is sort of a a, a curveball at you, bud. Um, uh oh. It's something that I've been thinking of as a creative person, as a photographer, right? And you yeah. probably thought about this as well. And you've gone through uh, companies, you've sold them, bought them, all this other stuff. And and at the end of the day, how do you define success for yourself? Yeah. Okay. So here's how I define it for me: is just being extremely happy and joyous in the work I do, um, and have enough income to sustain that enjoyment. So ironically, for me, success, you know, you ask me 20 years ago, I was all, you know, just young ego dick. Um, was all about, it's all about the money, man. I just want to be rich. That's success. And now I want to be rich in a new way. I want to be rich in happiness. Mm. So I only go into the work that I love to do. But the, the irony is this. When you really love what you do, you become elite at your skill, and it attracts elite customers who pay you the most. So I found is actually the most profitable method too to really live into what gives you happiness that's fantastic again uh with your upcoming presentation at yale can you give yeah. us a hint as to what you're going to be covering i know it's it, it's, it's sort of based on the book the it's totally and I ha you know i just happen to have it strategically positioned behind me Ooh, nice. you know, by, by pure chance right so this is the book it's called the pumpkin plan and what i discovered is that 
just by pure happenstance, I studied the pumpkin farming industry, and the vast majority of pumpkin farmers are the ordinary pumpkin farmers. Like you and I went out around Halloween. Right. You know, you're a seven year old. You're picking the pumpkin up. That's the vast majority. There's a small faction that grow pumpkins, not maybe to that size, as big as a city, but they grow these colossal pumpkins. I've seen so them. I, stu yes. I studied that group. They change the growing process of a pumpkin just a little. They change a few things, and the pumpkin responds with explosive growth. Well, once I realized this, I thought maybe this translates to business. I applied it to my own companies, and as you said, I, I built and sold companies using the strategy, and then I'm like, I got to write about this. So what we're going to talk about is pumpkin farming. Mm -hmm. And the strategies that we as photographers can simply implement, a few small changes, and it results in explosive growth, healthy growth. And, and ironically, it forces you to focus more on what you love to do, the elements of your business that you love to do. Boom. So that's wow. what we're talking about. Excellent, excellent. The presentations uh, on February 5th, I believe yep. it's uh, 6.30 to 9 o'clock is the time frame. Uh, I look forward to uh, meeting you directly for the first time, and yeah, you know I, I'll be in the audience listening and taking notes as well. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, oh, it's been it's been a joy. The time you've given me, yes, appreciate thank it. Thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.